What's the difference between good design and over-engineering? And how do we achieve the first while avoiding the second? And what does that look like specifically when we manage it? Today I want to explore the difference between big upfront design and incremental design, and specifically what YAGNI means, and how, when done well, this helps us to avoid building tomorrow's legacy system today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Thanks to our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis and Transfic. They've been supporting the channel for a while, so please support them in turn by checking the links in the description below. If you'd like to understand more of my ideas and approach to software design and how that fits into an engineering approach to software in development in general, my best-selling book, Modern Software Engineering, explores these ideas in a lot more detail and in the broader context of my recommended engineering approach. It's had some great reviews so far, so do check out the links in the description to this video. I have never thought that agile development meant that we should stop designing. Actually, quite the reverse. I think that coding is all about design, and so if we are coding, we are already designing. Working in an agile way really means designing incrementally all of the time. But there's a fine line to tread between good design done all of the time and a kind of naive floundering with no real design direction at all. So there's some work, some thinking, that we need to do to get started. At the other extreme is the very old but still common anti-pattern of big upfront design. This attempts to specify the design, sometimes in great detail, before we even start work on the code. Both of these extremes are wrong and probably pretty much doomed to, to failure. So how do we hit the sweet spot in the middle? There are several ideas that come together to help. Working incrementally, using abstraction and modularity to maintain our ability to make incremental progress, and YAGNI, you ain't going to need it, spring to mind. YAGNI comes from extreme programming. If you haven't read Kent Beck's book, Extreme Programming Explained, I'd very strongly recommend it. It's packed with great ideas that don't go out of fashion. My copy is the first edition, so maybe a little bit different to what you'd buy today. But in my copy, chapter 17 is about design strategy. It has some interesting things to say. It talks about ideas like working on the simplest thing that could possibly work, making progress in small steps, and in its terminology, design through refactoring. It also has a, this nice picture describing how design complexity increases over time. The core idea here is this idea of the simplest thing that works, as far as you understand it now. The graph shows how designing for things that we don't yet know we need, or don't yet properly understand, is a certain recipe for increasing design complexity. Software design is a tricky subject and it's difficult to come up with hard and fast rules. But these extreme programming ideas of the simplest thing and YAGNI are good guide rails. They aren't perfect truth, but there's a lot of truth in them. I don't know how you approach things, but I know that when someone starts to explain a problem to me, in the back of my mind, part of my brain is thinking about solutions. This is too early to do this. We don't yet understand the problem properly, but it's very hard to avoid coming up with solutions, nevertheless. I think that most technologists do this to some greater or lesser extent, but we need to be careful with what we do with that. It seems to me that one of the defining characteristics between good development and bad is how soon you commit to a design. Some people seem to commit fully to the first idea that springs to their minds. I think this is a big mistake. My first ideas on design are nearly always done. My brain seems to go through at least a few different stages when thinking about design. The first is deciding, is this even feasible? At this stage, my design ideas are usually so horrible, so crazy, that I'm not going to speak them out loud. 
I may mumble something like, well, it's possible if I'm really pushed. The next stage is to try the process of trying to find that simplest thing. Where should we start? And what are my first thoughts on what that might look like? At this point, the conversation is all about exploring and understanding the problem. How does this work? Why do you do it like that? Would it still work if you did this instead? And so on. These conversations aren't about the solution. That's still private property inside my head. What I am doing is, I think, similar to an idea that I got from reading about physicist Richard Feynman. When he was in college, he used to win beer by betting with his fellow students. He'd bet that he could solve any physics problem that they could state in five minutes in two minutes. He described his technique as creating a mental model of the problem, a kind of imagined physical device. He built this imaginary mental construct while the problem was being explained. When the problem was finally stated, he'd run it through his mental machine and describe whatever it spat out. Mostly, that earned him beer. Obviously, Feynman was a genius, so I'm not claiming to work at his level, but this strategy works pretty well for software. As the problem is being explained, we run it through our mental model and refine our model as we find mistakes and gaps in it. Our model is probably still pretty nasty, a fuzzy ball with sticks and levers, as Feynman described it. But it's a usable first guess. Once your model seems to stand up to these mental tests, now is the time to try and get a simple version of it out of your head. I like informal diagrams, but I'll use anything that best fits the needs of my model. I once remember explaining an idea for a design with playing cards. What I certainly don't want is a deeply precise structured class diagram or similar. We really want this process to take minutes rather than days. Personally, if I'm doing this for a big project and I want to get a big broad brush overview of the problem, I think it's okay for it to take a few days, two to three maybe. This is more about context setting than model building though. And during this time, I'm really trying consciously to avoid making assumptions about solutions. To design individual features of the system, we're back to minutes or maybe an hour or two for a hard problem. The next step is to get some firmer validation of our first thoughts. So it's time now for writing some tests and code. Let's pause there for a moment and go back to where we started. At this stage, we have a decent understanding of the problem in front of us. We have a rough idea of one way that we could imagine approaching it. Whatever it is, it's going to be wrong. So what we'd like to do is to start figuring out where it's wrong. So the extreme programming advice is a very good guide. We want to focus strongly only on solving the problem in front of us. And one reason that we are going to do that is because our current understanding of the problem is almost certainly wrong. Our current solution is bound to be wrong too. So we don't want to commit too solidly to whatever solution it is that we're looking at and exploring. Our first stab at the solution is certainly not going to be as simple as it could be. Our job is one of refining all this stuff over a series of small steps rather than seeking some divine spark of genius inspiration. Extreme programming and continuous delivery are deeply rooted in this idea of making progress incrementally in tiny steps. So what we'd really like right now is to find the simplest solution that could possibly work that solves only the problem that we're certain of, the part of the problem that we're focused on solving right now. One of the difficulties here is that there are two kinds of simple, really, simple stupid and simple smart. Obviously, we're looking for the second one, but the difference isn't always quite as clear as we'd like it to be and as easy to spot. This stuff is very subjective, and maybe this is really part of the art of good design rather than the science. But the engineering part is to maximise our ability while we're in this phase to make good choices and limit the blast radius when we don't. So making progress in small steps and taking an evolutionary approach to design is the engineering response. Let's imagine that we start off and we have a problem to solve. Maybe buying a bookshop, yeah, yet again. Our first feature is to be able to find a book. 
But for that, we need to add a book to the bookshop before we can find it in a test or in reality. At this stage, with code and tests like this, it's no big deal that everything is inside the bookshop. But how far do we have to travel down that path before this bookshop is a bloated big ball of mud that does everything in our system? One class to rule them all. Remember the design advice again, Yagni. A naive view of Yagni is, I don't need to think about good design yet because my code is so simple that any design will work. This is true, and for the first step, it's no big deal that we put everything into one class. The problem is that it doesn't take too many more steps before it starts to become a pain, and it isn't very clear when you cross that line. So my advice is to adopt some heuristics that will guide your design decisions and put them into play from day one and every time that you approach a design problem. Otherwise, at some point, your investment in code and tests will be enough to make you not want to change things when you should. If I change my design now, I will have to write, rewrite all of my tests. I don't think that Yagni was intended to work against good design. Rather, it was aimed fairly firmly at the problems of over-engineering. If I'm building a bookshop and I start off by thinking one day this bookshop will be so successful that it will need to scale to millions of users, and I build it like that from scratch to scale to million users, but only a three ever show up, I've wasted a huge amount of time and money. So Yagni steers us not to design our system to be scalable when we don't really have that need right now. Instead, we're going to do the simplest thing that can possibly work. If we're smart though, what we'd really like to be able to do is to kind of keep the door open so that although we don't do the work to make it scalable now, on the day that we find that we need it to scale, it's not gonna scare us to death and we can evolve what we already have to be scalable. Now this sounds like a horribly big ask. It sounds like we all have to be prescient geniuses to imagine what it will take to be scalable in the future. But I don't think it's quite as bad as it sounds. This is where the techniques of managing complexity that I describe in my book come in. If we aim to build software that is modular, cohesive, has a good separation of concerns, good lines of abstraction between the pieces, and generally manages coupling appropriately, this code will be easier to change. It's not that we need to predict the detailed future of our software. Rather, it's that we design our software to be easy to work on, easy to change, and in ways that kind of leave the door open for us to revisit it and correct it or refine it when we learn more. This is what Kent Beck meant when he said design through refactoring. Good design is an incremental process of learning and discovery. And so we need to retain our ability to learn and discover. The ease with which we can revisit our code and change it safely and with confidence is a marker of its quality. If we're scared to change it, then the design's poor. If we can change it, maybe even radically, without fear, the design's good. So even though, for my bookshop example, my first rough sketch is this, and even though this second step is a bit more code, I still say that where I end up is better than where I started. If this was really the starting point of some code I was writing for a real system, I'd be happy with either the first version or the second, to be honest. But certainly a strict view of Yagni would say that I don't really need the second, very slightly more complicated version just yet. I'd be happy with either version because in this small example, it's trivial to change the first version of the code and its test into the second, when I decide that I can use that separation. On the other hand, in reality, I'm pretty certain that I would start with version one, and then when I hit the refactor step in my red-green refactor TDD cycle, I'd refactor it to version two. To be honest, I might even have jumped straight to version two as the first step. My real point here is that if I'd started with version one, then I will be taking more risks if I don't move to version two quite soon. So I make the choice to make this move as soon as I spot it during design. 
I think that this is strictly breaking the Yagni principle, but actually I'm kind of happy with it because it leaves my options more open. My code is easier for me to change. I also think it improves the durability of my tests and my code may be only a little, but it's still better. I'm a big believer in separation of concerns and one of the reasons that I let it drive decision making like this is because it helps me to design code that's easier to change in future when I need to. In early steps in my design, some of the abstractions that I add may be trivial and not strictly required. Later, I may find some of them wrong and need to change or delete them. This is all part of an evolutionary approach to design. We accept that some experiments won't work out. But with this approach, I tend to leave the doors more open to change without me knowing specifically what the nature of that change is likely to be. The way that I think about this is that I always have a design in mind at every stage. Some structure, a bit like Feynman's fuzzy ball perhaps, that guides decision making and chooses and choices in my design as it evolves. One way to look at software design is that it's about adding some structure that helps us to decide where a particular behaviour of the system should live. This gives us a way to find our way around the system more easily, a way of communicating and discussing ideas with other people, and a way of deciding where we will add new ideas, even if there isn't yet an obvious place for them in our design so far. You may think of some of this as architecture rather than design, but I think that the divisions between architecture, design and code are all pretty blurred, to be honest. They're all really part of the same activity, to my mind. What all this really means is that all these things are, or at least should be, highly iterative and highly incremental. As we come to add some new idea to our code, we realise that it changes some of our design assumptions. So we need to update our fuzzy ball model. Changing this model may have implications for our broader system architecture. So we may need to pause and revisit some of our assumptions and figure out how to fit what we've learned in. This is what I think Kent Beck meant when he described design as an incremental thing. However smart we are, even if we perfectly understand the problem before us right now, the real world isn't that simple. It will change behind our backs and invalidate our assumptions. Software isn't built once and then stands perfect for the rest of eternity. Real software is much more organic than that, so our ability to change it is a fundamental aspect of its quality. I'd go further. Once it works, maintaining our ability to change it is what good design is really all about. Having some simple guidelines that steer our choices in design when we don't yet have the full picture then seems like a very sensible strategy to me. I think of my approach to design as being pretty defensive but it works well for me in helping me to create code that I can always return to, sometimes even years later, and still change with confidence. Of course, this is part of a greater whole. Good design is reinforced and encouraged by test-driven development, for example, and test-driven development and acceptance tests provide a further line of defense against me making a mistake. But the modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction, and coupling in my designs does that too. Big upfront design is a losing strategy. Sure, it's possible to write the software that way, but it isn't going to be very good unless it's incredibly simple. Even then, you're taking a risk. Maintaining the freedom to evolve our software is the bigger picture strategy, and this begins with some very fine-grained simple design decisions. Thank you very much for watching.